I'm Joanna Stern. I am a personal technology columnist at the Wall Street Journal, and I am your moderator and host for the wearable revolution. Not the actual revolution, but the panel that we're going to be here today. And I've got some really, really, really great panelists up here. Let me bring up their names so you can keep track of them. Um, well, they're actually not in order of their sitting here, but you can match the names to their little signs here. It's a fun game we're going to play. Um, but let me start down here with Mike Bell. Mike Bell is the <coughs> vice president and general manager of the new device group at Intel. Yes. He's got a long history in the industry. He worked at this company called Apple. He worked at another one called Palm. And he's doing some interesting things at Intel, not only in, wearables, in the wearable platforms, but all different types of computing platforms. So I have a lot of questions for you, Mike. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> Next, we have Chris Gloday. Did I say that right? Perfect. Oh, yes. OK, great. He is the general manager at Under Armour for Connected Fitness. But he leads the business activity for Map My Fitness, which, if you guys don't know, is an awesome app that helps you track your run, helps track what you eat. It is a great app. And so he's going to bring a lot to the conversation about social components and connecting these devices to each other and um, to us. Next is Carmile Roberts. He is a partner and co-founder of Northbridge Venture Partners and MC10. And Carmichael um, is an investor, but also is really involved with this really cool company called MC10, which makes sensors and some flexible, cool stuff. I've got some images, really cool stuff. He's going to bring a lot to the table about the future of this technology and how we might see it in different places on our body. And last, we have Limor Schaffman. I did that right. She is the founder and CEO of Globe, Globe Shift. And she's got a deep history in the industry on wireless, of the Internet of Things. And at Globe Shift, she's doing something really ambitious, maybe more ambitious than some of the rest of the people on the panel, which is trying to, to uh, bring together different types of people around the world through technology and actually really some sort of spiritual stuff. So i um, interested to hear what you're trying to do with technology there and make our hearts sing as one, so to speak. I think you, it's like actually says that on the website, which is awesome. So we're going to talk about... A couple of things, definitely hardware, definitely talk about the software and design of these things, but more broadly, how wearables um, can change our lives in ways that smartphones have or, or go beyond the ways smartphones have and all these other types of computing platforms we've seen around CES and over the last few years. But I want to kick this off, and let's see, uh, with an image here. And so there might be uh, differing thoughts on, on what you see here, but to me, these are two devices that can put a lot of information on your body or on your wrist, but they're ugly. I, you know, I don't find them that attractive. They're chunky and they're ugly. Or that's, that's my opinion of them. I know it might not agree. Maybe uh, no, you guys might agree. I don't know. Um, and so I wanted to kick this off first with you, Mike. Would you say, you know, is there going to be at some point where we look back at this generation of wearable devices. And these are two fairly new wearable devices. These came out over the holidays, or one of them came out over the holidays, where we look back in these and we think about that this time is sort of like the time when we started with a 25-pound laptop, <laughs> where we look back and say, remember when people wore these things. And so how far along are we with the technology that goes inside here? And is that what's sort of holding up the space? And that's why these things look this way. Well, I, I actually think the biggest problem with those is that they don't have Intel technology inside of them. So that's, that's the <laughs> biggest don't. issue. They do not. They that's do not. Issue. OK. All right. Now, now what's, it's interesting. So um, you know, we, uh, in, our, in our push into wearables, early on understood that wearables really are a very personal thing, and that perhaps it had to be more like a, a, something the jewelry industry or the watch or a consumer industry would put together and less what a technology company would do. So I think you see a lot of examples of technology companies that have rushed to what I call putting, you know, put cell phones on people's wrists. It, it, I don't think that's going to be where this ends up. I, I don't think that's what people really want. Everyone wants to be an individual. They want something they wear to, to tell people what they think of themselves or how they want to be seen. So I think, um, you know, we are going to look back on this and say, hey, it was an interesting start. But wow, we came such a long way very quickly, I think, too. The technology's there. It really just takes imagination. And you guys announced a platform yesterday. We did. Um, and I actually have a quick photo of it here. This is the Curie platform. And so this is a really tiny sensor you guys announced, right? Yes. yes. Is this type of technology going to enable us to make things smaller? Is it the processing power of the problems? Is it the battery? What's the... Well, it's interesting. So um, as many people may know, up till now, what people have done is largely repurposed low-end cell phone chips to become wearable chips. And when you think about it, a cell phone, the processor is usually mostly off until the radio wakes it up to do something. Whereas a wearable is always on, always listening, always sensing. So fundamentally, 
a great wearable chip is very different from a hardware architectural perspective than a cell phone chip. So this is our first chip that's designed very specifically to be a phenomenal wearable chip. It turns out our low-end cell phone chips are pretty good too, um, but this one is designed to operate on very low power, always on, always sensing. Um, we've put software on top of it so that you can basically do, uh, you can characterize what a person is doing in a very low power way. And it's a platform we think has huge horizontal implications. You know, people can build a wearable very quickly by taking this and then putting their secret sauce on top and not redoing all the basics that everyone has to do. And how long, when does this Curie come out? We've said uh, second half of the year. Second half of the year. We'll come back to battery technology after, but Karma, I, Karm, oh no. I don't know how to use PowerPoint. <laughs> it's a thing. Journalists don't know how to use PowerPoint because we hate it. So do tech people. Yeah. But yet you bring them to every meeting. <laughs> I use Keynote. You personally. I use Keynote. Oh, you use, right. Yeah. Apple guy. So Carmichael, I want to ask you about the, this MC10, which is this company you work with, yep. or you founded, and what's going on with some of this bendable technology, the sensors, what does that enable? Will we not have to have these big chunky things for much longer? Right, right. So you, you started off by saying they're chunky, clunky, and that you didn't really like them. Um, That's just and, my opinion. Right, but it, what we find is a lot of people's opinion, and it's, oh, good, it's consistent good, with what Mike was saying. I mean, if you think about wearables, wh what do you really want? You want something that's almost you know, feels invisible and seamless and comfortable uh, and very personal, uh, personal. And so, you know, this particular technology is, you know, one of, you know, I, we believe one of, the, one of the ways that you address that. And that's coming up with things that dissolve sort of the boundaries between electronics and humans by making the electronics actually seamlessly fit conforming to round curvy folks, which all of us are round and curvy somewhere than others. But, you know, that we all I like have. those choice of words. Right, you like those, right? <laughs> yeah. So, but yeah, that's essentially what MC10 does with a, with a stretchable form of, sil of silicon and other electronics. So MC10 is the company that you guys make the sensors. Explain a little bit about where what you guys do and where this might end up. Yeah, so uh, MC10 started off, I mean, the first, the, the, the primary invention is fr from a professor at a university of Illinois named John Rogers, who came up with a way of taking silicon and making it stretchable and conformable. And so the hardware is the initial invention that's the, you know, call it the discovery and the, the key thing. And off of that, MC10 is building broader systems around the hardware to make it pretty seamless to integrate these in a variety of products in a variety of industries. So it's, it's the, it's, we, we hope as we look up years from now, you mentioned, mentioned what will things look like years from now, we hope that um, technologies like what MC10 has uh, will be sort of transformative and help uh, change the way devices are, are seen and used and wearable. Yeah, at the show I've seen, the two most interesting wearables I've seen at the show are um, sort of these stickers that you can place on your body. Um, one is this thing called Temp Track, and you mm -hmm. can, it's a flexible adhesive piece, it's almost like a band-aid, right. and it has a Bluetooth module in it, and that can tell you your temperature, or your baby's temperature, it's meant more for kids. Right. And then another one's called Amp Strip. Yep. Um, you guys, you, you're aware of these? You're oh yeah, yeah. With so that's, that's the general direction that we believe yeah. The, the industry is going in, right? It's it's literally think about tattoos. If you know who, you know, several people in the uh, in the audience right now may have a variety of tattoos that you can see or you can't see right now, and certainly you don't even think about it. And that's closer to having a stamp or um, you know a, a sticker, if you want to call it, or a band than something that's clunky. Yeah. Right. Limor, I'm going to ask you about wearable clothes and mm. the idea that these sensors can be built into our bodies. I mean, not into our bodies, into our clothes, but maybe one day into our bodies. Um, <laughs> and you can answer that question as well. When are we going to have sensors in our bodies? But what's your take on some of these clothing objects? And since you've been well-versed in this Internet of Things space, I mean, now it's sort of the Internet of our clothings. Right. I, you know, do you want to take, you want to hop in and put do you want yeah, no, Limor, I would love to. Oh, good. I'm trying to get this to be a group conversation. So if you guys have anything to chime in about what your companies might be working on. and So um, I think that the internet, the clothing stuff is actually really interesting because I've been watching the space for a while and reporting on it also. And starting with just the, the basic stitching and everything, but what was really interesting, it was just that actually at an M Health Summit in uh, Santa Clara 
couple of weeks ago. And what was fascinating is what's happening now with the flexibility. So now they're having fabrics that DuPont is coming out, and also DuPont is actually coming out with inks, that the, they're, they're, they're flexible, they're stretchable, and they're washable. So now we're actually going to be able to become fashionable in what we're doing. And, you know, my family was in the fashion business. I was just talking about my, you know, my dad was in federated department stores in the retail. And so, you know, I've grown up, I'm waiting, I've been waiting forever for these things to actually look good, feel good, and also be able to be durable. And at the same time, um, I'm really capture, I don't know, what kind of information do we want? And I think one of the things that I know we're going to talk about data probably is that it's not necessarily just capturing my heartbeat or where I am and how, how healthy I am, but can it cause some activity to be happening at the same time? And so what I like to look at is the eco the cross system of ecosystems. So as I'm walking into a room, not only am I, is it going to sense me this way, but it's going to sense me through my clothing and cause different things to start happening or my car, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm sure we're going to go on that line. But that's how I see things happening from a, from a clothing and a fashion sense. It's going far beyond the biofeedback biometrics, it's actually starting to have activation in our environments. Yeah, no, that's really fine. I think that's a big question that I do have about the data and where we go with that. And then, Chris, I think your company, we've talked a lot about the hardware here, but the software, we're all going to be wearing these different types of things. How do we connect to, how do we connect to each other, right? If we're all running with these different types of things, how do we connect with each other? Where's the social media element? And also, where is, what happens with that data? Yeah, sure. We think there's a few dimensions to it. So one is our position has always been to operate an open platform. And for us, that means that consumers can bring whatever devices they want to the party. So we think the social element is really critical. We think that I might be using um, one type of wearable, one type of tracker. My mom might be using something else. My coworkers might be using something else. But we should all be able to collaborate, compete, and engage on a neutral playing field regardless of what device we choose. So we spend a lot of time and energy pushing for standards and integrating as many devices as we can into the platform. From a motivational perspective, we also think that there is an experience that the consumer needs to have relative to their data that goes beyond what any of us um, are doing today. So we feel like the last five or 10 years has been about data collection. And data collection is hard, and it still is very hard, but it's becoming more mature. Um, we think about going beyond the bar graph, though. So a lot of applications, a lot of experiences are built around graphing your data over some time period. And that's interesting, especially for the early adopters. But we think for real behavior change to happen, the onus is on us now, all of us, to understand how to contextualize that data, how to build a story around it, how to make it more motivating for the consumer through insights that go beyond just presenting the data back to the user in different graphs. Yeah, I think that's interesting because there's now a lot of stats that people, a lot of people have bought these fitness devices. They bought the Fitbits, they bought the Jawbones, but then all the analysts seem to be coming up with data that says people stop wearing them or using them after four months or so. And to me, um, and I think there's a lot of uh, also analysis going on that that means that people are just, they kind of find out what they're doing and then they don't really need these things to find out because they probably are in the same routine. So there's, the software hasn't gotten more advanced enough to, to do that. Mike, I'm going to kind of direct that at you because yeah. I know you guys, you acquired Basis. We did, yeah. In fact, I, I, I love the product. Um, one of the things we found and one of the things that really uh, encouraged us to buy Basis was, as, as you mentioned, um, having to present the data in such a way that the user could do something with it, not just go, oh, I didn't take enough steps today. So Basis has this concept of habits where you, you as you do more, you unlock these habits and the software itself kind of helps guide you to things you should be doing. You know, get up and walk more regularly. Take a walk at night. So it's, it's a bit of gamification. It almost makes it, you know, fun and involving for someone to participate in this. Not just like, you took 100 steps today. Woo! You know, which, which gets tiring after yeah. a while. You, know, you have to really make it something that, that uh, involves people. And we, we find that's a big deal. Um, our, the, the information we have around the basis device shows that the majority of people who buy them are still using them six months, eight months later, which is huge compared to the, like the simple pedometer things that people throw in a drawer after a couple of weeks in some cases. Right. And you also just got an email, so. Uh, isn't that cool? Yeah, this is the new uh, notification feature that we're shipping. So yeah. the other thing is, you know, people have, there's this thing about, well, fitness trackers go away when smartwatches come out. Absolutely, I, I, absolutely not. I mean, we have a couple features we've added that make the make our device a little more like a smartwatch in ways that people care about, and we think there's going to be a very healthy ecosystem for fitness trackers. Yeah, I mean that's something to open up to the group. I mean, with this 
we, we've got the Apple Watch on the horizon. We've seen a couple of interesting things here. You guys, Intel's partnering with Fossil and a number of other high-end luxury brands. I'm going to actually bring up this, which is, I thought, some good examples of devices that are not ugly and chunky, um, though the Moto does look big on my wrist, but it's a nice, really nice piece of technology. Um, you know, where, where do you see the smartwatch capabilities and advantages, the notifications, the deep app ecosystem, blending with some of these health devices? I mean, is it going to be a one-size-fits-all thing? I mean, Apple seems to be trying to do that. Is there opportunity for different types of some of these niche products that tell you to get out of the sun or tell you your skin looks bad? I, I think... Tell I, you you look bad. They all tell us we look bad. Those, I mean, those probably won't sell very well. But, um, <laughs> you know, I, I think the nice thing about wearables is it's not one-size-fits-all, that there is room for... Uh, a different set of devices. Um, many people don't want the Swiss Army knife on, on their on their wrist that you know opens the garage door and cooks breakfast. Something that does a few functions really well uh, is great for many people. You mentioned some of these up here. I'm I'm kind of partial to ours. I have to I have to plug this. Um, we partnered with Opening Ceremony in Barney's in New York yeah. to do something which is a, a very high end fashion device that also happens to have a 3G modem and notifications in the back. So it doesn't scream I'm a geek when you're wearing it. You know it gives you subtle notifications. It does three or four things. It does them really well. There's a market, I think, for many of these devices. And it's not a one-size-fits-all. It's a very personal. And after, I think one of the things to consider is, do we think, like Swarovski, I don't know if anybody has gone by their booth, but they've done with interesting crystals, and they have great stuff to take a look at, yep. because it actually looks good, it looks fashionable. Yep. But I'm wondering whether, you know, just like the fashion business, there are so many different ways that pants are being made and looked, but everyone's got kind of their thing, and you, you've got your Ungaro, you've got your Escada, you've got your guests, and so they all serve a purpose, they all have their brand. So I wonder if wearables might end up going in that way. Way. Well, one, because those designers are going to start incorporating wearables in their own designs, but also might wearables head in that direction as well. Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. Cool. Uh, Chris, I want to come back to you with um, some of the integration with the phone. Because I think the interesting thing with, um, with Matt My Fitness is you guys really took off on the phone, right? People are running with their phones. They're doing tons of they're logging their food with their phones, they're bringing it to the gym, they're able to do all that. We, how do you think the wearable ecosystem plays into it? And does that help sort of take away the friction of people having to do more? A little bit. In, in a lot of ways, um, we view the phone as kind of the original wearable. So it's not necessarily the most comfortable thing. There are people who refuse to work out with their phone. But for, for, for a large extent of our audience, at least, people are tracking workouts with the phone. Overwhelmingly, yeah. the majority of fitness tracking events that we get coming into our platform come from the smartphone alone. And then as the ecosystem has evolved and we see more and more wearables now, the phone has really become the hub. So it's more like this central server that can collect this information, process it, provide more data back to the user, whether it's on a smartwatch interface, whether it's through the phone itself, whether it's through some sort of notification to a wearable device. So we see the phone as being absolutely critical and not being replaced um, by wearables, not being replaced by smartwatches, but being even more important as a, as a valuable kind of hub component for the whole experience. Yeah. Actually, I forgot to mention this in the beginning. At the end, we will take a couple of questions. So if you have some questions, kind of get them in your mind, and we'll come to you guys in about uh, 20 minutes or so, 15 minutes or so. But I um, want to ask about eyes. So we've talked a lot about the wrist. And I've seen a couple of people, no, no one in our audience today wearing Google Glass. Any Google Glassers out there? How many people wearing glasses? Real glasses. OK. So and I saw someone made an announcement at the show about some connected real glasses. But wanted to talk about uh, Mike. And I'm going to direct this at you again, because I know you guys just uh, are working with Vuzix, which is a kind of eyewear company. Well, they, they do virtual reality and type of heads up display stuff. What's the opportunity with eyes? Or do you think that there's ever going to be this time where we can wear something on our head that's not VR, but some sort of everyday piece of technology on our head? Uh, yeah, the short answer is yes. Um, so we, we're doing a few things. We're, we're working with uh, Luxottica, who it turns out, if you own or buy glasses or sunglasses, they probably were made by Luxottica. They're the company that no one knows, but they're behind every eyeglass brand on the planet. Um, Oakley. Oakley. In fact, yeah. one of their brands is Oakley. We announced right. here that we are doing a product with Oakley that will ship this year. Um, I, again, I think that a, first of all, it has to make sense to, wear, to put technology on your body where you're putting it. 
I think that there are really cool uses for having things on your head. And it doesn't have to be, again, this general purpose does everything. I think if you build something that uh, you know, gives somebody context or information in such a way that it's useful without them having to do stuff, I think it could just be killer. So, and I think the technology, certainly the, te the technology we have will enable us to do something like that. So not, not pre-announcing anything, I will say though that I, I do think, I think Google has an interesting idea. I think it's gotten us talking about the social norms and social acceptability. I think it's made it so that when something comes out that looks like a regular pair of glasses and has the same features, people won't like think it's foreign, a foreign concept because they've already seen it. So I, I, uh, I expect some interesting stuff in this. Yeah. So we're talking about still the heads up display type of thing, but in a more um, elegant way, you think? Hmm, I can't tell you. You can't tell me? No, I, well, I, I, I'll Are you wearing them right now? I might be wearing them right now. <laughs> what does it say? It's actually saying, don't answer this question. It's, it's actually what it's saying. Is. My, my PR people are saying, answer yeah, this and you will yeah. die. Yeah, exactly. Right. No. Um, yeah, you know, it's interesting. The, 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 the way people have done it to now is put a little kind of display, you know, heavy prism assembly and things like that. Fundamentally, I don't think that is going to be whatever takes off. So I think there's some technologies coming um, that will let you have a very natural looking appearance and still have a display of information. Hmm. Carmichael, anything to add on that and, or Limor on companies you know about that are doing some interesting things? Well, but I would, you know, I, let me combine a couple of things that were said. You know, I think Mike said, you know, it's, it's not as though uh, there's not a lot of room for a lot of different types of products that do a lot of different things. And I completely agree with that. And, um, and you know, the, the natural convention of, of how do you come up with something new and integrated is to look at what exists. So the idea of putting in watches, the idea of uh, looking at glasses and so forth, or even clothes, we talked about clothes a bit, makes perfect sense. So I see a lot of, you know, I'm in, I'm in the business of not only creating companies, but also funding companies and ideas that come out. So I see all sorts of um, ideas where I bucket them into two categories. Um, how do you take existing platforms that, you know, everyone in the audience are used to calling wearables, which is interesting. That's a name I was, you know, having a couple of conversations earlier. What does wearables really mean? Yeah, I um, hate that word. Right, and a lot of people hate they that word. I was talking to actually my, one of my par partners earlier uh, today in the firm, he said the same thing. I hate that word, and we, we, str we were struggling for a word to give you after we said we hate that word, but we don't have one <laughs> for you, unfortunately. Let's but, you know, there's that, that, that category of, and then there's the the abstract of, if, if you really think about what you really want to do is hang a picture, it's not so much that you need nails or, or, or uh, you know, sticky tape, but you just want a picture on the wall. In other words, what we really want is sort of seamless way for interacting with the environment, getting information and so forth. Then I look at ideas that come out that are completely off the, you know, off the charts in terms of, um, you know, conventional things. And, uh, and they would, you know, and, and th there are things in that, those categories that people look at. Very few. You can even walk around in, uh, at CES and you don't see, I would say, you don't see a ton of that. You see a lot of watches. So you see a lot of the same sort of things with slightly different twists, which is normal. But I think the, uh, some of the most interesting ideas are ones that are completely unconventional and perhaps even far-fetched. Is that like the belty? It's the, <laughs> it's the belt? Yeah. The, for those that you got, haven't followed some of the the hype around a belt that is called the belty and will adjust itself when you have eaten too much and does some other tracking things. I mean, it, it's it's certainly different, like yeah. you're saying. Yeah, ideas that are completely different. So, and I think there's room for all. There, we'll see this in all categories. I think that there's a ton of opportunity for for products, and it's, yeah. that's one of the best things about this category. Competition is great, but there's so much room to grow in that. Um, you know, I think we'll. We're at the tip of the iceberg, so to speak. Yeah, yeah of course. Um, so uh, one of the things, that I happen to be in Washington, D.C., so of course, surrounded by the military. So one of the things, and speaking to some people over there, is contact lenses. I know it's just a natural extension again, but contact lenses that have the capacity to offer augmented reality, um, and it's not too far from what we saw with one of the Mission Impossibles of blinking your eyes and you're snapping a photograph or something like that. And they're actually working with this technology. So we know that it's not going to be that far out from when we're going to start seeing it here, possibly at CES, um, and also available in the marketplace. So, you know, don't, I would just say that the imagination, there is no limit to the imagination of what's possible. And what I think is also really fascinating, and I'm hearing it a lot from the different speakers at this conference, um, is that the technology is here. 
and actually I would really welcome to see what's, what you all think about this. I think the technology is here. Now the question is, now what do we do with it? How do we make it, you know, we've sort of proven that the watches are happening, we've proven that certain things are happening, but what are we going to do with it? How do we make it practical? How do we make it actually usable and functional for us? And what do we really want to see happen? Because we've proven it, so now what's next? And I think we're actually at a really interesting place because we can ask that what next question right now and start developing products accordingly. I, I think you're I think you're right on a lot of levels I think also there are some places where the technology might not be ready I think batteries is one place one place where I test a lot of these and you have that trade-off if you have that display well that means you're charging something once or well, usually once a day you know sometimes every other day or something like that but then if you don't have the display um, actually the basis does a really nice job because it doesn't have an LCD or has a um, monochrome display um, so that, that's one area I think hopefully we see some improvement. I don't know if any of you guys want to comment on that. Well, it, it does get back to, um, you know, you really have to figure out what the right features are for what you're trying to build. If you build a fitness watch, you have to charge every day and you claim it tracks sleep, it's probably going to work too well if it's on your charger and it's not on your wrist. Yeah. Um, you know, there, there are new display technologies, you know, being a little geeky, transflective displays. Sony has them in their watch. It turns out outside they're very readable, they're fantastic but it doesn't have quite the color saturation that the, the bright ones do, but you get better battery life. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's something where people are trying all these different combinations, and part of it is what will the general public accept? You know, what are people, are people okay with the colors being a little more washed out, but having great readability and great battery life? And this is something we're going to see play out over the next year. Chris, I wanted to ask you a little bit about um, <coughs> interface design, because one of the things I find pretty frustrating with some of the fitness apps or some of the companion apps for, for some of these smartwatches or, or fitness bands is that I'm getting a lot of graph data, data like it looks like I'm looking at some sort of earnings report and it's like, you know, I'd stepped so many steps this day, my heart rate was this, you know, when is the interface, and you, you mentioned you're getting smarter at interpreting this, when is the interface going to kind of also catch up there to make it just interpret it for us so I don't have to go interpret the data? Yeah, I think it's heading in a few directions. Um, we just launched a new product called Under Armour Record. It takes a completely new approach to presenting the data back to you to see how you're doing on a daily basis and kind of mashing up activity and sleep data in a way that we think is new and really easy to understand at a glance. Uh, I think also the interface going away is a big thing. So getting a text, getting a notification, getting some sort of update from your wearable about how things are going can be a lot more powerful than opening something up and looking at a full screen, looking at a full graph. A lot of times just a quick piece of information about how your day is going or a tip or, an, or, a, or a, a prompt to get more active can be a better user interface than even the most beautifully designed you know, full app. That's, a, that's actually something I hadn't really thought of. That's, it's also like then we start to communicate with our devices in the ways we communicate with our friends and family. Yeah, I mean, we, we look a lot at how people interact with personal trainers in, in Under Armour. And, uh, you know, text messaging is still the thing. Like, people have an initial meeting with their trainer, they go to the gym, they work out. A lot of the interaction beyond that about motivating people, getting them to show up on time, pushing them to work harder, happens via text messaging. So it just goes to show that a really simple um, interaction, you know, can be really powerful for the user and it doesn't necessarily have to be um, some sort of beautifully designed experience. Although we think that a beautifully designed experience is also sort of a huge part of it and also table stakes. I mean, coming from um, Map My Fitness, one of the things that we've learned over the years is that people just absolutely love maps. And one of the reasons why people loved tracking their fitness in the early days and even now is because they get this beautiful souvenir of their workout afterwards in the form of a map of where they went. And you can't um, underestimate the value of creating something beautiful and visual with respect to how it motivates people to get active. Yeah, that's actually, it's such a good point. I love actually just seeing where I've been. Yeah. It's like, you you know you were there, but then you're like, oh yeah, I did I did do that. Yeah. 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 Um, another area we haven't talked about is actually Bluetooth headsets. It, you know, they used to be this sort of, um, I don't know, I want to say that word on stage, um, it is uncool thing. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I shouldn't say that word on stage. Um, and so it, the industry sort of looked at them in, in, a, in a pretty poor way. You still see some people talking on the phone with them, though we've got hands-free stuff in the car. Is there some really interesting future for things we can wear in our ears? I've actually been hearing this word, hearables. Maybe that's the, the 
than the wearables alternative hearables. <laughs> I, I definitely think so. I mean, for one thing, having a sensor on the head, getting back to the earlier conversation, gives you a lot more information, especially from a fitness perspective, about the position of the body, the motion of the body. So in, in fitness, as everyone knows, people are working out, people listen to music. It's a really natural fit. So we think that having uh, sensors on the head, sensors in the ear is a huge part of that. And then providing audio feedback, back to the interface design question, actually, the audio feedback that we provide through our apps is one of the most engaging things that users talk yeah. about. It's one of the areas that we focus on. People want to get that feedback. And so combining all the data from sensors and wearables from a fitness perspective and piping that into advice, motivation, and things coming through the ears is really, really valuable. And yeah, it then, makes me think of her, you know? Yeah. Her, I mean, I would love Scarlett Johansson in my ear all day long, but um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We, uh, we actually do something similar, if I can mention. So our partners, SMS Audio, uh, people may know about this, have a heart rate monitor right. in the earphone itself. Mm -hmm. And the cool thing about this is instead of having Bluetooth, you have to pair and charge and all that stuff, you literally just plug it into the phone and it gets power off the phone itself. So you have your phone, you have Map My Fitness, One Keeper, wherever you use, you put this in and suddenly you get sound and you get some biometric information without having to like learn something <coughs> new. And so I, I think that you know the sensor on your head Get in, because of the unique place, as you mentioned, is a really great place to get some of this kind of information. Um, and there's also great technology coming out for impaired hear, listen, hearers. Yeah. So that either, I, and I think there's one device here, I'm so sorry, I don't remember the name, but it's an earplug and you put it, and it, it sort of senses the, the vibrations and it translates it. And then I've also tested a hat that had, it was capturing the vibrations that you caught on the skull and it fed it into your ears. And as a result, you could actually hear. It was astonishing. And so I think there are some really interesting technologies that can help people who are impaired in different ways also. I want to take the last 10 minutes to ask a question and have you all respond to it. And it's that you know, with the smartphone, it changed so much, right? And there wasn't one single app that really changed the world, I think. It was so many different things. And it was the ability that we could have this in our pocket. And I won't really expand on what, what was so revolutionary about the smartphone. but. What with wearables, and I'm saying the term again, I hate it, but what with smartwatches or fitness trackers or any of these devices we've talked about, ear hearables or beltables, or uh, what, what do you think is the, the killer feature or service that's going to change someone's world and why would they want to wear it? It's a tough question, but... You know, really, I'm just trying to get out, like, what is it that we get out of this? And people ask me, like, well, why would I wear that smartwatch? Why would I wear that fitness band? What does it do for me? And so I, 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 in my columns, I try to explain or evaluate products. I'm like, well, this is what it did for me. Um, and they do some interesting things now, but I'm wondering, where does it go? What is it going to do for me? Okay. We'll start down there. Okay. And we don't have to go in order if it takes others time to think. So I think I'll go back to what I said initially, and that is that I'm very interested in how things are going to affect my environment. So there are two elements, and one is that, I, frankly, I want to be able to walk into a room and I want it to respond for, to me automatically any way that either I choose or that it knows from my past behavior or something that concerns me. There's a lot of prognostication that's going to start happening because of all the data. And so, but I want to be able to walk in and things are going to start turning on. Um, I, my the, the car is going to know where to go, um, my, wh whatever I want to eat for breakfast, it knows it, or I can say, hey, listen, I want menu one, and everything starts cooking and happening, so that then I'm freer to do other things. And so what I'm looking forward to is the impact that I'm going to be able to have on my environment and the extended environment, because I think we're looking at ecosystems that are going to be interrelated, and then also the level of automation and also personal choice, one hopes, but also automation that's going to happen in the environment and the result that automatic behavior that's going to happen as a result. I love that answer. And, and, and so do I. I love the answer as well. And I completely agree with you. So I'm going to build off of it and add to it. Um, and I want to be able to do everything you said, and I want it to be very personal and secure. I want to know that when I come in and I have that entire interaction that's seamless, um, I, I don't want to worry about, I remember like one of my worst experiences as a um, I, I couldn't, I mean, always in sensationalizing it, but I still remember it as a 13 year old as I got in a wallet and I put all this stuff in my wallet. I was all excited that I got a wallet like my dad. And then, um, I remember like three months after that, I lost it and man, I was panicked. 
I mean, as I laugh about it now, because what did I really have in that wallet? Probably not much, a bunch of nothing. But yeah, I don't want to worry about losing stuff. I wanted to be, I don't want to worry about the security. So I wanted to be as one with me and to be able to do all the things that you just described and have um, it to be updated really easily. And I think when, you, when you're able to do that, that's a real seamless wearable you know, experience that you know, we probably would have a name other than wearable at that point. Yeah, what is the term in the future too? I'm gonna, you have 10 minutes to think of that one. <laughs> <laughs> For us, um, from an Under Armour standpoint, we talk about making athletes better. So we think across all the sports, and I think, you know, heart rate monitor has been around for a couple decades. It's obviously proven that it helps athletes improve their cardiovascular endurance, things like that. I think there's an opportunity across pretty much every sporting category to help athletes improve their performance. And that's something that we're very, very focused on in a lot of key categories. But I think we look at it more broadly than sports and fitness, and we really think about the impact that wearables can have on digital health in general. So we talk a lot about how when you take your car into the mechanic, um, they can plug in this diagnostic information and get hundreds or thousands of data points about your car. As a driver, you can step in and see 15 different gauges on the dashboard and understand a bunch about your car. Um, even today with all the technology, when you walk into your doctor's office, she opens up a manila envelope with some chicken scratch and maybe a chart from the last time you were there 18 months ago and says, how do you feel? And we think that that's crazy. And we think that we're in a position to help solve that. We think that doctors and the health, um, the health ecosystem should have access to all of the amazing data that these wearables are creating today. And helping solve that problem and bridge that gap is something that we'll be focusing on more and more. So I have, I have three quick thoughts. The first one is, we have we time, so we're good. Talk, I'll, I'll talk very fast. Uh, we talked about uh, smart no, no, shirts. We I've said we, ha we have, yeah, we're okay on time. Okay. Well, we talked about smart shirts, that sort of thing. It, it's interesting the ones today give you your heart rate. Um, what's more interesting to me is those can be available to do biometric authentication. So suddenly clothing you're wearing can prove you are you. It can be the key that gets you in the door. It can do things that, you know, maybe it's more secure when you go to the ATM because the ATM knows you are who you say you are, right? Pins go away. I think there's something around... Uh, more than just quantification of, of health, I think there's something around authentication we can take advantage of. Also, uh, when these devices become invisible, so that you're not choosing to wear one of these watches or one of those watches, but the technology is so small and pervasive, it's built in, and it just it's everything it's in everything you do and everything you wear, and the devices can communicate together. You don't have to make as many choices because you're not making trade-offs. And then uh, touching on the healthcare theme, I think this is huge um, with the big data that's. Uh, explosion that's happening right now. If these devices could track what you do and then maybe go take a look at uh, similar people who have the same sort of genomic data and what's happened to them over the course of time based upon you know, your same levels of fitness and, your, and your, uh, the likelihood you, you'll have the same sort of experiences, that could be, this could be really powerful yeah. in helping people fundamentally you know, change their lives or save their lives. So I think it's not just about opening garage doors and looking at SMSs. It really could be transformative to the way you know, people live yeah. and how long they live. Great. Those are some amazing answers. And now I'm actually, again, excited about this category. Even though we started when we talked about these, I think it kind of comes full circle about okay. where we're going. And uh, they're not going to continue to be so chunky and ugly. So um, I want to open this up. We've got a couple of, um, yeah, we've got some time for some questions. If you have questions, I'll call on you, stand up, and I'll try and repeat your question to our panelists. So we've got one back there, the lady in the last row. You guys all hear that? Should I repeat that? Yeah. All right, great. Yeah. Anyone got a thought on that? Well, if you, if you don't mind me jumping in real quick, what I'll say is I, I agree. I think that's why you have some devices that look like that. Our approach has been, you know, we've partnered with the CFDA, the Council of Fashion Designers of America. We've partnered with people like Barney's New York, Opening Ceremony, Fossil, because they understand what people want to wear. And we're not trying to figure out how to make tech wearable. We're trying to figure out how to make really cool thing wearable things technologically enabled. It's a very much a flipping it on its ear kind of approach. It's also a lot harder than simply saying, well, we have a screen, let's tape it to your wrist. So I, I think that for wearables to ever get the kind of volume we think is possible, it has to be more of that approach where you understand what people want to wear or are willing to wear, and then you know, not just say, hey, here's what we can do with the technology. I would add that I think that's an excellent observation. Um, and thank you, because I've 
I admit that I've gotten wrapped up in the technology side of things. And I think, though, I would just say that let's have a little bit of patience because it's what clothing came to us from these organic, we need to cover our bodies from Adam and Eve, you know. Um, the technology wasn't there. That was a technology, in fact. Clothing was a technology. Um, now we're doing coming from a harder technology, like literally harder technology, and we need to make it softer in a number of different ways. And I think it's just going to take us time to do that transition and that translation. But thank you for bringing our attention to that. I'm going to take a question here in the first row. What are the uh, general thoughts about gamifiers using the word to change the behavior? Sorry, repeat the last part. We've, we've done a ton of that from a fitness standpoint. So for a long time, one of the biggest impacts, one of the biggest motivators for our users are fitness challenges. And we have a platform where we bring brands in and let them engage or challenge our users to do different things. So right now we're doing one with American Family Insurance where if you log workouts um, through the course of a given month and you get more active and you prove that through the workouts that you log, you can win an amazing prize package to come be a part of an Under Armour VIP experience on the campus and meet some athletes. And these types of programs, whether they involve a cash reward, some sort of recognition, or even just for bragging rights, are tremendously effective. We look at the population of people that engage in them before, during, and after uh, they engage. And you know, almost without fail, there's a huge uptick during the, the engagement period. But what's exciting is when you look at 30, 60, 90 days after the challenges have ended, a lot of times in those populations, there's meaningful behavior change in terms of um, them logging more fitness activities at least. And I, I love the question that you asked about the gaming. So I could tell you, like, it was probably about a couple of years ago, I, um, we started even at MC10 thinking about if you can put on things that are seamless anywhere on the body, why wouldn't you put on multiple devices on your hands, on your arms, on your legs? So who would, who would really benefit from that? The gamers would be probably the first to, to have a true big interactive experience. And I think from that, you can imagine what would be learned that would cross back over to all the different areas. Um, what, even beyond, we talk a lot about fitness, which I think is huge and important, but there are so many other areas that would, when we think about wearables that would benefit from um, things coming out of, of fitness, things coming out of things like gaming. And so just to put a vision on it, I would love to see, for example, MC10 to come up with devices that were part of a system that um, a gamer would use and wear. Uh, in addition to something like, say, an Oculus device that, that they have, which would give them an overall experience that they can interact literally with the person right next to them and, uh, and have uh, almost like a haptic uh, experience and, and feeling things. And that would, that would certainly be able to translate it out into other areas. It's a fun idea. Take the question over there. So when we move beyond the smartwatch and the technology is integrated into clothing, which brands do you think will own that space? The Question on Under Armour, do you want to? Yeah, it'll, it'll, it'll be Under Armour. Yeah. <laughs> with, it, with Intel chips, hopefully. Yeah. yeah. And, his, and your flexible sensors. Right. And, 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 and MC10 will be the Intel inside Under Armour, and Intel will come obsolete. Just kidding. Oh. Just kidding. <laughs> kidding, Mike. Mike, bias. Bias and stuff. <laughs> I mean, that was not an actually answer offer an answer. I would say, um, <laughs> you know what? I think it's the who knows. Um, I think I think it depends on, you know, some of the questions of what we some of the things that were said earlier were sort of really important that you were saying, Joanna, is there are costs associated and there has to be a cost benefit analysis to the adoption of these wearables within the fashion and within the clothing. So the question is, are these fashion houses going to choose to go that path or not? And in what way? And versus the technology companies and, and what they see as their path and their strategy. And frankly, they each have different strategies. And then where's the confluence point going to be? And you know what? I have no idea. But I think those are some of the issues that people are going to be considering. I'll chime in and say I hope it's the fashion companies, because I've been wearing a connected shirt to workout classes for the last two weeks. And I get, I'm getting looks because they don't know that there's technology, but there's some big thing kind of on the side of my, of my shirt. And so, you know, people are wondering, like, what's going on? I'm hoping the fashion could kind of slim that out and, me, you know, make us look better. I, I do think the fashion brands understand this and would like to get into this space. 
But the, to, I mean, you know, we all look at this technology and say, oh my God, another smartwatch. It turns out to do one of these devices really well is actually really difficult. Mm -hmm. So the, the fashion brands are hungry to learn how to build this stuff. And from our perspective, they understand the customer, they understand how to make stuff look good. So if we can help figure out how to technologically enable these folks, I think that's when we're gonna see really cool stuff. Yeah. Let's see, I've got, we've got five minutes left, so I'm gonna take the woman here in the second row. Then I'll It's a great question, Chris. Yeah, it's a great question. It actually ties back, I was gonna mention on the earlier question that um, we feel like uh, the innovation that's happening on the technology side, um, on the wearable side, there's a lot of young companies, startup companies that are innovating very, very rapidly. As we're seeing in 2014, and I think we'll see increasingly in 2015, consumer trust around what's happening with this data will become increasingly important. Uh, in the smartphone world, um, people are using apps on a daily basis and providing all sorts of data input to those apps and having no idea where it goes. It could be going to a server in some guy's closet. It could be going off to um, some country that has different laws that we're not familiar with. Consumers will be much more savvy around that. And we think that the bigger brands that can build that trust with the consumer will be the ones that ultimately win in the long run um, with regards to collection of data and really being that, that central home for the user to, to be able to store their data with over the course of their lifetime. Um, from a security perspective, though, it's impossible to um, overstate how sensitive this information is to the consumer. Um, our position is um, we put security first and we put a lot of time and effort from a resource perspective into making sure that our data does stay secure and in addition that users completely understand how, when, and if their data is being used in any possible way by any third parties and finally giving the consumer the choice to take their data with them or to enable for, through very explicit and clear opt-ins um, how and when their data would be used for, for some sort of other third-party service. And, and you know, just to, to, to further build off of that, I mean, here at CES now, I'm, I'm running into to friends in the, in the pharmaceutical industry who, when you think about wearables, and I know in, in terms of the kind of deals and the things that they're doing, um, they're taking what's been learned from, 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 um, from companies like, you know, like Under Armour and building off of it with technologies to really talk about data that you'd be very concerned about getting, um, getting lost. And so building off of the answer before about what the future needs, the first thing out of my mouth was security around that because I think that in the end when we get all excited that you know our information can go everywhere and everything is seamless we're going to get just as concerned and 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 the regulations uh, and the regulators are going to be even more concerned about that and so um, what what uh, that issue around security has not been I'll be blunt about it because I'm in the middle of it with a couple other companies has not been um, answered in a way that's that's uh, you know that it's done but I think it will because it's such an important piece that goes beyond fitness to just uh, overall uh, wellness and healthcare for people who have diabetes or people who have uh, neurological diseases or cardiovascular disease. It's a big, you know, it's a big, um, big area um, and, a, and a big impediment that will be solved at some point. Great. Question here in the front row. Yeah, Well, I'm actually more interested in, so flexible displays, obviously, you, know, you see the mock-ups of people having stuff wrapping around their wrist and all. I, I, I'm actually more interested, frankly, in displays that uh, when they're on, you see them, and when they're off, they're completely transparent. I, I want a Breitling that when I push a button, a smartwatch appears in the crystal, and when I push the button, the smartwatch goes away, and it looks like a Breitling, right? I, I think that's more interesting. You know, people have been wearing jewelry for how many years now? That hundreds of thousands of years. Um, they have people have their favorites. This is a, about a personal choice. I think we need to make the smart technology look more like what people want to wear. This flexible displays. I think people will do some interesting things with it. Maybe you wrap it around the watch band. I mean, who knows? But I, I actually think that there's a lot more interesting work to be done in a display that that can go away and not be visible when you don't want it to be visible. Time for a couple of other questions, actually. There's any others out there? Right here in the second row. Something that I'm missing is uh, the, well, thinking about the industrial use of wearables. Um, it's not talking about that. Uh, what do you think about the use of wearables as a means of transportation? Um, and how do you think that will be 
Well, from a head-mounted point of view, I think industrial is the, maybe the number, the biggest market for that. I mean, if everyone working on airplanes or cars or whatever has the infinite manual set for everything they do at their disposal and can look at it while they're working on things, I think, and, and it's not a huge trade-off like you have today. I think that could be enormous. I think there, and even uh, you know, we, in our Intel Make It Wearable challenge, we had some people who did wearable gloves that help protect the worker from injury. It's not just about information display. It could be about you know how to make the job safer. I, I, and if you can do that, if you can maybe even shave a couple seconds off the cycle time of making a gazillion widgets, I mean that's real money. So I think people will pay for that if they if you know we see uses that are actually that actually make sense. There's room for it all. Yeah. I think actually it was at the Intel booth that I saw there's a glove that one of the startups That's is it. making yep. Yep. that was great and so it's just to help the manufacturing plant move that much faster. Um, I, you know what frankly I think wearables have been part of industry for decades already and so um, so it's a natural, it happens that we haven't been talking about it, but it's happening all the time. Um, I just think it's a little bit less of the, maybe the design, it's more very much more functionally oriented, but I think it's extremely active space. And they're coming all, I mean, I know um, Motorola was actually doing all kinds of head-mounted, sort of cyborg-y kind of things. And what's really interesting actually about the um, enterprise space is that they have particular issues that we don't have on a consumer level. So you have people, you have, people who are coming in and it's new people all the time. So you have certain kinds of levels of durability, of the ability to make it cheap enough so you can throw out a pair of gloves, put a new one in and have it attached to the sensors, or put it in, throw out the head mounted display because you don't want the one person's head to be on with another person's head because of whatever, cleanliness and stuff like that. To make it disposable, functional, durable, all kinds of different issues than the consumer market has, which makes it that much more interesting actually. Um, so anyway. I would say the uh, the majority of individuals working in the first world at least are in a body position throughout the course of their day that's not optimal for their health anyway and there's a huge potential for wearables to help us get people to move their body you know throughout the course of a day that's different than what they're doing today which is frankly you know causing a huge tax on people on a personal level and on the system in general by having people sitting around you know most of the day we have time for one more if somebody's got one more question out there there's a one guy on the ground over here that's okay. It's a good question. Any ideas? I mean, on I, I think I think the reason why. So first of all, I think there's market validation that it's real right now. It's it's probably relative to the amount of hype and the amount that we read, it might be more or less real depending on that. But there's there's real markets being created around wearables now. There's companies that are selling millions of dollars and millions of units worth of wearables that have propped up, you know, very, very quickly. Why now? I mean, I'm sure Mike can speak more eloquently to this. The sensors are smaller, the batteries are lasting longer, you can do more with them. There's new kinds of sensors. So the technology has evolved very, very quickly, piggybacking on piggybacking on what's been done on smartphones from an OS and a hardware perspective. And it just makes more things possible now in a smaller form factor than could be done five or 10 years ago. Yeah, I agree. I think the hardware's gotten to the point now where it's, it's not such a stretch to build these devices. And I also think, frankly, that acceptance of these devices is, is a lot more natural because cell phones are so pervasive. The smartphone, everyone has one, so it's not so weird that you might have another piece of electronics on your body as well. So I think that the whole smartphone push has really helped, uh, almost legi helped legitimize this space. And I'll, I'll answer it a little bit from a, from a venture capital standpoint, like from an early stage investment. Um, if you look historically at uh, areas that were, were new and hot, it's almost always you see failure in the beginning, you see, you you know, otherwise people aren't really pushing it, right? So you, 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 you'll see technical failure, you'll see market failure, you'll see go-to-market failure, and so forth, and um, and then there'll be a lot of learning, and, and often a lot of shedding of me too, and then you see spectacular things. And I, I think that we're still in the earliest part of wearables, we barely, you know, scratched the surface. And, and so when you look at the dynamics of that and you sort of compare it to other areas, it's not unusual that you had some, as you mentioned, false starts and, and 
uh, some promise that hasn't turned out to be, you know, exactly what one Im imagines. But that's the time when things get really interesting. If I may add, um, I think there are, there are a lot of things happening in parallel. So we've been talking just about the wearables, but how about, let's say, what's going on with the health system? All kinds of capabilities are coming up with the health system, and all kinds of capabilities are coming up with the data around the health system. And then you have, let's say, diet. And so when you're going to start happening is all these things that are happening kind of in parallel, all of a sudden they're going to start converging, and the technology is going to start speaking to each other, and then all of a sudden, bang, you're going to have this really amazing experience. And that's what we're all aiming for. And so that's, so I think we're just at the beginning, and everything's kind of happening in different pods, and then all of a sudden it's just going to come together. And that's going to be extraordinary. So that's where I think we're heading. Great. I think we're going to wrap things up. Thank you to all the great panelists here. Thank you all for coming. And uh, hopefully some of us will hang around.